This video is going to concentrate on cigarette smoking in relationship to heart and other circulatory diseases. When most people think about the dangers of smoking, they automatically think about lung cancer. There's a whole lot of people who have this belief that if they ever cure lung cancer, they'll be able to smoke safely. Well, first, we're nowhere close to a cure for lung cancer. But let's say someone comes up with a magical cure tomorrow. It's not likely to happen, but for argument's sake, let's say it does. Would that mean smoking was safe? If there was a magic cure tomorrow for lung cancer, over half the people who were dying from smoking-related illnesses now would still die. Because most people who die from smoking do not die from lung cancer, and most people who die from smoking do not die from lung disease. They will die from heart attacks from smoking and other cardiovascular problems and vascular problems throughout the body. The following slides will explain how cigarette smoking affects the heart and the arteries that lead throughout the heart and throughout the body and why cigarette smoking is responsible for so many deaths from cardiovascular problems. While tobacco smoke consists of over 4,000 different chemicals, many of them poisonous, there are two which are primarily responsible for the cardiovascular risks. They are nicotine and carbon monoxide. First, let's look at the adverse effects that nicotine has on the heart. Nicotine is a stimulant drug. If you were to take the pulse of a person who hasn't smoked for at least two hours in a resting state, let them just smoke a cigarette doing no other activity and take their pulse again, you'll find the heart rate will speed up by about 21 beats per minute on average. Then, nicotine raises your blood pressure. So now your heart is working faster by being stimulated and it has to work harder against an increased blood pressure. Nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. It takes every artery in your body with nice big openings in them and makes them get smaller. The arteries to your fingers and toes are small to start with. If a person were to take their temperature in their fingers and toes before and after smoking, again, after not smoking for two hours, you'll find an average drop in a healthy young person of 5.3 degrees from one cigarette. Nicotine also causes the body to release its own stores of fat and cholesterol. People know fat and cholesterol are not good for them, and they shouldn't be eating a lot. But the body doesn't only get it by eating it. The body produces its own. When you smoke cigarettes, nicotine causes your body to produce it and to pour it into the bloodstream. Over time, that fat has a tendency of building up within the artery walls and potentially clogging it all together, again, increasing the risk of heart attacks. These effects of nicotine, the stimulation, the raising of the blood pressure, the constriction of the arteries, and the release of fats and cholesterol increases the workload on the heart. This increases the oxygen demands of the heart. This is where the second major poison in tobacco smoke, carbon monoxide, has major impacts on the heart's ability to keep up with this added workload. Carbon monoxide poisons the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Now the heart is working harder because of all the prior effects of nicotine, the stimulation, the constriction of the arteries, the increasing in blood pressure, the buildup within the artery walls. To work harder, the heart needs more oxygen, but the carbon monoxide is poisoning the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, which means the heart has to pump harder to get more blood to itself to work harder because it's working harder. That is a vicious and a deadly circle that smokers' hearts are constantly exposed to because of that combined effect of nicotine and carbon monoxide. One other noteworthy effect of carbon monoxide is it seems to make fat stick to artery walls. So not only does nicotine cause you to produce the fat, but the carbon monoxide by lowering the oxygen levels in the blood seems to give this fat a greater adhesion, building up more chances of clogging forming over time. Here we have the cross section of a normal artery. Normally, there's nice big openings in the middle of the arteries for the blood to flow through. The blood carries oxygen and nutrients. Every part of your body has to have the ability to get blood flow because if it cannot, the blood cannot get through either because of a blood clot forming or because of a clog formation, a buildup of fat. Wherever that artery was leading, that part of the body will not get oxygen anymore and it will die within a matter of minutes. Here's an example of an artery with a blood clot. You can see blood can no longer get through this artery and again if this artery led to any specific part of the body that part of the body would not get blood, would not get oxygen, and it would die within a matter of minutes. Here we see a picture of a coronary artery pinned to the heart. Now the coronary arteries are the arteries that supply the heart with the blood it needs to function. We're not talking about the blood that goes to the heart that gets pumped throughout the body so other parts of the body get oxygen. This is where the 
heart itself gets its oxygen supply, the blood flow to the heart that is giving the muscle of the heart itself oxygen. Here is a close-up of that coronary artery. You can see there's a fat buildup on the outside. More significantly here, though, the blood clotted on the inside, the part of the heart that can't get oxygen anymore, uh, would die from this cutoff of blood flow. The damaged tissue that would be left on the heart would be called infarction, that scar tissue left on the heart after a heart attack. Again, the blood flow gets cut off, oxygen gets cut off, that tissue which is oxygen deprived will die, again within a matter of four to six minutes. If you look at this tissue, you could see it basically has become a brittle tissue, where normally the heart is a pump, it needs to be able to expand and contract to be able to push blood throughout the body. If a major enough portion of the heart is blocked off, that tissue will die, and again, if it's big enough, that person will die of a heart attack. Luckily, not all people who have heart attacks die from that first heart attack. Sometimes it's a smaller portion of the heart that which is affected, and the remainder of the heart will be able to compensate. The problem is, if these people are still smoking, they have the same risk factors that they had in the beginning, which very likely induced the first heart attack or aggravated existing risks, making it more likely. They still have these risks, and now they're working with even less heart muscle. Generally, when a person has a heart attack, the most important thing they can do at that point in time is get rid of the risk factors that exist, and smoking is always among the top. Again, nicotine and carbon monoxide are the two primary chemicals in tobacco smoke which are responsible for these clogging and clotting factors affecting the heart. But the heart is not the only part of the body which is affected by these two chemicals. Here we see an artery that has some blockage, but there's also some blood flow still. There's a few openings in this artery that blood can still get through. This is called an ischemic effect, where the part of the body is getting some blood flow, but it's a diminished capacity because, again, of blocking, which is starting to build up within these arteries. Now here's an artery just totally blocked with fat. Wherever that artery led, that part of the body, again, will get no oxygen, and it will die within a matter of minutes. If this artery were going to a heart, it would be a heart attack. Another common site of occurrence, though, is in the brain. This picture is showing the base view of a human brain. The arteries are very hard to see in this picture. They're very small. They're very clear. This is a non-smoker's brain, and again, it's probably a low-fat eater's brain, too, because there's very little fat built up in these artery walls. Here we see a close-up of those arteries in the base of the brain. Again, you can see they're very small, they're very clear, and again, these are, these are very healthy arteries. Compare this to what a smoker's brain has a much stronger tendency of appearing like. Here, you can clearly see the fat building up within these artery walls. Again, if you totally block an artery to part of your body with fat or blood clots form in part of the body, and this is often more common when you have fat build up within the artery walls, you increase your chance of that part of the body dying. If this is your heart that's affected, it's a heart attack. If it's your brain, it's a stroke. What happens is part of the brain gets a cut off of circulation. The part of the brain that doesn't get that circulation anymore it dies. At whatever function that part of the brain was carrying on, it's lost. If the part of the brain affected controlled speech, you won't talk anymore. If it were controlling motor function, you could be paralyzed, and if it was controlling major organs, it could result in death. This clotting and clogging factor increased by nicotine and carbon monoxide does not only happen to the major arteries in the body, the arteries to the heart of the brain, it happens to every artery throughout the body. Here we see an artery with fat starting to build up in it. Every time a person smokes a cigarette, the nicotine is taking arteries like this, sometimes with fat buildup, and putting them into constrictions. Sometimes the artery will get stuck into that constriction. More often than arteries getting stuck in constriction, though, blood clots form. This will occur because of tissue damage within the artery walls, the fat buildup, the constriction, turbulent blood flow. All these kind of things are contributors increasing the risk of blood clots occurring. If this happens to your heart, it would be a heart attack. If it happens in the brain, it results in a stroke. But another common site of occurrence is in peripheral vascular arteries, arteries that lead to your fingers and toes. If this happens and you cut off circulation to the fingers and toes, or again to the foot or the leg or the uh, hand or the arm, it will result in death to this tissue and will result in diseases that end up with people needing amputations. One rare form of peripheral vascular disease is known as Berger's disease. Here is a picture of a patient's foot 
who has Berger's disease. Gangrene had set in, and it ended up in the toe having to be amputated. Now, this person either did not quit smoking or artery damage was too extensive. Gangrene continued to set in after the amputation, and the only thing that could be done to a person once it gets to this point is to amputate the foot. The most common age bracket that Berger's disease strikes is in people who are 20 to 40 years of age. 20 to 40 is young to get circulatory conditions that result in amputation. The major reason for this disease is cigarette smoking. Berger's disease is a disease I talk about in all of my smoking clinics and in all of my seminars. Not because it is very common. That's not the issue. I've had hundreds of people with cancers from smoking. I've had hundreds of people with heart disease from smoking. I've only had probably, you know, 10 to 12 people who've had Berger's disease. I've encountered a few family members of, uh, of Berger's disease patients, but of actual Berger's disease patients in clinics, a relatively few number. But Berger's disease is a very unique illness. In many ways, I think it shows addiction better than any other disease out there. With many conditions caused by smoking, you can't feel it coming on. You don't see the symptoms. You, it's, it's sudden onset in many cases. Berger's disease, again, because of the age that it strikes and the way that it strikes, it shows addiction better than any other disease. My first encounter with a person with Berger's disease was back in 1977. I had a woman come to a clinic who was 38 years old at the time she came to the program. She had been diagnosed with Berger's disease three years earlier at the age of 35. Now, i got to point something out. 35 is old to get diagnosed with Berger's disease. Again, the most common age bracket the disease strikes is in 20 to 40 years old. So being 35, it's on the later end of the scale. She had peripheral vascular diseases before. She had problems, but they never knew exactly what it was. At the age of 35, they made a differential diagnosis. And her doctor told her, point blank, you have to quit smoking. This is a disease caused almost exclusively from cigarette smoking. In a sense, he gave her an ultimatum. You either have to quit smoking or you're going to lose your limb. Unfortunately, she didn't take that threat seriously enough because within a matter of months, she had not quit smoking, gangrene set in, and she had her toes amputated, and she eventually lost her foot and then her leg. So then she's released from the hospital. She didn't smoke while in the hospital. She had the amputation. She now took seriously what the doctor was saying, and she stayed off of cigarettes. She stayed off for three solid years. She was doing fine. She was on a prosthetic leg. She was back at work. She was socializing. Under the circumstances, she was doing very well. She was at a party one night three years after she quit smoking, and someone offered her a cigarette, and she figured, hey, I've been off for three years. I can control it now. I'll smoke one. If I like it, I'll smoke one or two a day. That's all I ever liked anyway. If I don't like it, I won't smoke anything. That's what she thought. She took the cigarette. She said it was not a good cigarette. It was a particularly raunchy cigarette. It was a really kind of miserable experience. Within a matter of 24 hours, she was smoking a pack and a half a day again. Now, I'm not saying if a person never smoked a day in their life, they take a puff, they're smoking a pack and a half the next day. It doesn't work like that. A person takes a long time to build up a tolerance to nicotine at that level. But once a person is addicted, I don't care if they quit for three years. I've had people in clinics who quit for over 30-year periods who were chain smokers again because they didn't understand this premise of a puff. Well, she was one of them. She didn't understand that premise. She took a puff. It was a miserable cigarette. The next day, she was up to a pack and a half a day. And three days after this, four days after relapsing, she lost circulation in her good leg. Now, understand what's being said here. She was off for three years with no problem. One day she took a puff, she was hooked, and then within four days she lost her circulation. She had to realize the implication of what was going on. She went to the doctor at the time that the circulation was gone, and the doctor was just flabbergasted that she went back to smoking. And he, he hits her up again, the ultimatum. He says, if you don't stop smoking right now, you're going to lose that limb. And again, this was no idle threat on his part, and she knew it. He had already taken off her leg at one time, and now he's talking about the other leg. He sends her into my program, and this is when I meet her. Again, she's 38 now. She comes to the clinic. She quits smoking. She's fine. He had stuck her on anticoagulant drugs and vasodilators as soon as she came in. He was trying to slow up the process as long as he could, but he knew he couldn't slow it up forever. He had tried that before, and it didn't work, and it was not going to work now. She had to quit smoking. Well, 
she does quit smoking, and within two weeks, she was off all the medication. She didn't need it anymore. Her circulation was fine. And I figured this was the last time she'd deal with smoking. She will have learned from her past experience. I call her up nine months later to come serve as a panelist for me. To me, she had a very powerful story. Not the fact that she was an amputee, but how she went back to smoking. This was a very powerful story. When I got her on the phone to ask her to come serve on the panel, she said, oh, she was sorry, she couldn't make it. She's, she's been in the hospital the last couple of months. And I asked her, oh, you know, what happened? I didn't expect this for an answer. She's hemming and hawing. And all of a sudden, she, she kind of just says, uh, well, she can't make it. Um, she, she, she had her toes amputated. And without even thinking, I just blurted out, I said, you went back to smoking? And she said, yeah. She didn't believe she was going to get hooked again. She did. She eventually had her toes off on the second leg. She eventually lost the foot and the second leg. As I said, I've had other people in smoking clinics with Berger's disease. The reason I talk about her, though, was there was one, one very unique experience that she had. As I said, she had quit for three years and was fine, took a puff one day, and she was hooked. Not only did she get hooked, but she lost her circulation almost immediately. She understood the addiction to smoking. She understood one puff was going to put her back to smoking. She didn't believe it, though. She understood it, but she didn't believe it. She took that puff, and she was hooked. She eventually had her toes amputated on the second leg, and she eventually lost the second leg. Now, she what was unique about her is she came back to me, and she comes in to tell me that she had finally quit smoking again, and she was doing fine now. And I looked at her, and I said, how did you finally quit? What finally convinced you to quit? Now, your doctor warned you about this years ago, and you didn't listen. It got so bad that, again, you had the first amputation. You quit for three years. You should have learned that if you ever took a puff after that three years, you'd get hooked. And not only did you get hooked, but you'd lose your limb again. I thought you'd never touch one again, but you did. You had your toes off, you didn't stop. You had your leg off, and you didn't stop. Now you're coming and telling me you'd finally quit smoking. And I said, how did you finally do it? What finally put you over the edge and, you know, convinced you to quit? And she said, oh, the doctor finally convinced her to quit. He said, listen, you might as well keep on smoking. I'm just going to get your arms off next. That scared her to quit smoking. Her next comment to me was unbelievable. She looks at me straight in the face, dead serious, and says, hey, I didn't need to have a house fall on me to quit smoking. She had two legs chopped off, and she didn't need to have a house fall on her to tell her to quit smoking. This is how irrational many of the people I deal with are in smoking clinics. I'm not dealing with crazy people. I'm not dealing with insane people. I'm dealing with addicted people. Addicted people will say things and do things which are absolutely ludicrous, yet it makes sense to them at the time because they're protecting their addiction. In America, we lose over 400,000 Americans every year from cigarette smoking. Most people, when they think about smoking-related deaths, they just think about lung cancer. They think about lung disease. Some people think about heart disease and circulatory problems, but they don't give it the priority that it's due. The fact is, over half the people who die from smoking will die from vascular diseases, diseases affecting the heart, diseases affecting the brain, diseases affecting peripheral vascular arteries. People need to consider the full implication of smoking, not just think of one illness. The number of people who come in saying, boy, if they ever cure lung cancer, I'm going back to smoking, are really missing the point of how dangerous smoking is on numerous different fronts. And the only way to eradicate the risk of all smoking related diseases is to make and stick to a personal commitment to never take another puff.